Hi, Heart Room friends. Nice to see you. So today we're reading the BFG by Roald Dahl, and we are on page 162. We're almost done with our story. We're reading the Royal Breakfast today, which is one of my favorite chapters. There was a frantic scurry among the palace servants when orders were received from the queen that a 24-foot giant must be seated with her majesty in the great ballroom within the next half hour. The butler, an imposing personage named Mr. Tibbs, was in supreme command of all the palace servants, and he did the best he could in such a short time available. A man does not rise to become the queen's butler unless he is gifted with extraordinary ingenuity, adaptability, versatility, dexterity, cunning, sophistication, gagacity, discretion, and a host of other talents that neither you nor I possess. Mr. Tibbs had them all. He was in the butler's pantry, sipping an early glass of light ale when the order reached him. In a split second, he made the following calculations in his head. If a normal six-foot man requires a three-foot high table to eat off of, a 24-foot giant will require a 12-foot high table. And if a six-foot man requires a chair with a two-foot high seat, a 24-foot giant will require a chair with an eight-foot high seat. Everything Mr. Tibbs told himself must be multiplied by four. Two breakfast eggs must become eight. Four rashers of bacon must become 16. Three pieces of toast must become 12, and so on. These calculations about food were immediately passed on to Monsignor Papillon, the royal chef. Mr. Tibbs skimmed into the ballroom. Butlers don't walk, they skim over the ground, followed by a whole army of footmen. The footmen wore knee breeches, and every one of them displayed beautifully rounded calves and ankles. There is no way you can become a royal footman unless you have a well-turned ankle. It is the first thing they look at when you are interviewed. Do you think that's true? Push the grand piano into the center of the room, Mr. Tibb whispered. Butlers never raise their voices above the softest whisper. The four footmen moved the piano. Now fetch a large chest of drawers and put it on top of the piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Three other footmen fetched a very fine Chippendale mahogany chest of drawers and placed it on top of the piano. That will be his chair, Mr. Tibbs whispered. It is exactly eight feet off the ground. Now, shall we make a table upon which this gentleman may eat his breakfast in comfort? Fetch me four very tall grandfather clocks. There are plenty of them around the palace. Each clock is twelve feet high. Sixteen footmen spread out around the palace to find the clocks. They were not as easy to carry and required four footmen to each one. Place the four clocks in a rectangle eight feet by four feet alongside the grand piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The footmen did so. Now fetch me the young prince's ping-pong table, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The ping-pong table was carried in. See the grandfather clock being carried in? Unscrew its legs and take them away, Mr. Tibbs whispered. This was done. Now place the ping pong table on top of the four grandfather clocks, Mr. Tibbs whispered. To manage this, the footman had to stand on step ladders. Mr. Tibbs stood back to survey the new furniture. None of it is in the classic style, he whispered, but it will have to do. He gave orders that a damask tablecloth should be draped over the ping pong table, and in the end, it looked really quite elegant after all. At this point, Mr. Tibbs was seen to hesitate. The footmen all stared at him, aghast. Butlers never hesitate, not even when they are faced with the most impossible problems. It is their job to be totally decisive at all times. Knives and forks and spoons, Mr. Tibbs was heard to mutter, hmm, our cutlery will be like little pins in his hands. Mr. Tibbs didn't hesitate for long. Tell the head gardener, he whispered, that I require immediately a brand new, unused garden fork and also a spade. And for a knife, we shall use the great sword hanging on the wall in the morning room. But clean the sword well first. It was last used to cut off the head of King Charles I, and there may still be a little dried blood on the blade. When all this had been accomplished, Mr. Tibbs stood near the center of the ballroom, casting his expert butler's eye over the scene. Had he forgotten anything? He certainly had. What about a coffee cup for the large gentleman? Fetch me, he whispered, the biggest jug you can find in the kitchen. A splendid one-gallon porcelain water jug was brought in and placed on the giant's table beside the garden fork and the garden spade and the sword. So much for the giant. Mr. Tibbs then had the footman move a small, delicate table and two chairs alongside the giant's table. 
This was for the queen and for Sophie. The fact that the giant's table and chair towered far above the smaller table simply could not be helped. All these arrangements were only just completed when the queen, now fully dressed in a trim skirt and cashmere cardigan, entered the ballroom holding Sophie by the hand. A pretty blue dress that had once belonged to, the, to one of the princesses had been found for Sophie, and to make her look prettier still, the queen had picked up a superb sapphire brooch from her dressing table and pinned it on the left side of Sophie's dress. The big friendly giant followed behind them, but he had an awful job getting through the door. He had to squeeze himself through on his hands and knees with two footmen pushing him from behind and two pulling him from the front. But he got through in the end. He had removed his black cloak and got rid of his trumpet and was now wearing his ordinary simple clothes. As he walked across the ballroom, he had to stoop quite a lot to avoid hitting the ceiling. Because of this, he failed to notice an enormous crystal chandelier. Oh no, what happened? A shower of glass fell upon the poor BFG. Bung hummers and bog swiggles, he cried. What was that? It was Louis the Fifteenth, the queen said, looking slightly put out. He's never been in a house before, Sophie said. Mr. Tibbs scowled. He directed the four footmen to clear up the mess, and then with a disdainful little wave of the hand, he indicated to the giant that he should seat himself on top of the chest of drawers, on top of the grand piano. What a fizz-whizzing, flesh-bunkling seat, cried the BFG. I is going to be as bug as a snug in a rug up here. Does he always speak like that? The queen asked. Quite often, Sophie said. He gets tangled up with his words. The BFG sat down on the chest of drawers piano and gazed in wonder around the great ballroom. By gumdrops, he cried. What a spiffling, wopsy room we is in. It is so gigantic. I is needing perculars and telescopes to see what's going on at the other end. So we'll stop right there, boys and girls, and tomorrow we'll read more to find out what the BFG eats. The royal breakfast. Bye. Bye-bye.